Although most movies run for a couple of hours, some are just so epic that they deserve a runtime twice as long or more. So block out a few weeks on your calendar, get cozy, and enjoy. These are the best films ever made that are over four hours long. The 1963 historical epic Cleopatra begins shortly after the Roman emperor Julius Caesar wins a massive civil war. Arriving in Egypt, he meets and falls in love with Cleopatra, daughter of the pharaoh, with devastating consequences for Caesar, Egypt, and the entire Roman Empire. Over the course of the movie, Cleopatra is crowned queen of Egypt, has a child with Caesar, and is eventually forced to pick sides when Rome is divided after the assassination of her lover. Initially angered that her son, Caesarion, was not chosen to succeed him, Cleopatra is given another chance to interfere with Roman affairs when Mark Antony approaches her and asks for supplies in his war against the would-be emperor Octavian. Plenty of backstabbings and bloody battles ensue, and well, let's just say, things don't turn out well for Antony or Cleopatra. It's not that often that you can say a four-hour film might be too short, but that may well be the case with Cleopatra. The only real problem with this film is that virtually every chapter of The Real Cleopatra's Life could fill out an entire miniseries, and director Joseph L. Mankiewicz tried to stuff most of it into his movie. So you gotta give him credit for trying and creating a straight-up masterpiece in the process. If you were skeptical that the long-awaited so-called Snyder Cut of 2017's Justice League would live up to the insane levels of hype it generated, you weren't alone. Snyder's filmography is generally hit or miss, and although there has been the occasional bright spot, the DC Extended Universe has mostly been something of a disappointment, especially in comparison to the far more successful Marvel Cinematic Universe. As such, all the signs are pointing to a Snyder Cut that was only superficially different from, but not better than, the so-so theatrical release. And boy, were those signs wrong. Zack Snyder's Justice League isn't exactly Dark Knight brilliant by any means, but it's a truly worthy superhero team-up outing nonetheless, and a significant improvement over the original version. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells, he's never fought us, not us united. It's also a triumph for Snyder and his fans, who fought tooth and nail to get this version of the film released after years of being the butt of superhero movie jokes and putting up with destructive creative meddling from the studio. In the end, the release of this four-hour epic turned out to be one of Hollywood's greatest redemption stories. Each of the three parts of the 2010 French-German film Carlos is longer than the one before it, and they're all the length of an entire movie. The story follows the exploits of Illich Ramirez Sanchez, otherwise known as Carlos the Jackal, a real-life political terrorist who committed multiple violent acts in Europe on behalf of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Part 1 follows Sanchez as he fights alongside militants in the Middle East before moving to London and then Paris, taking part in multiple killings and bombings along the way. The chapter ends with him adopting the name Carlos and escaping capture by the French police. Part 2 focuses on a single real-life terrorist attack staged by Carlos in which he kidnapped multiple OPAC officials, but then released some after being unable to find any countries in which he could seek asylum. This part ends with him becoming an agent for hire for a number of nation states and setting out to work within the Soviet sphere of influence. Part 3, the longest of all, follows Carlos's continuing operations in Eastern Europe, exploiting the geopolitical instability in the region to traffic arms between various clients and sponsor states. Perhaps inevitably, the movie ends with his 1994 arrest by French intelligence agents. Sound like a lot? Well, it is. Which is why Carlos, which was originally a TV miniseries, clocks in at a truly impressive five and a half hours. Gettysburg, the made-for-TV epic about the Civil War battle of the same name, shouldn't work half as well as it does. The decision to cast reenactors with their own uniforms and gear may sound like a no-brainer, until you realize that the reenactors don't tend to look much like scrawny teenagers who actually fought in the battles the movie depicts. On top of that, the action is bloodless, the cinematography felt unimaginative and dated even in 1993, and you can very nearly see the strings holding up those goofy fake beards. And then, of course, there's the fact that the director's cut goes on for four and a half hours. And yet, somehow, the movie manages to be more than worth a watch. Randy Elderman's score is one of the most underrated of the 90s, and the main cast give career-defining performances. Jeff Daniels gives one of his best as Colonel Chamberlain, whose regiment is forced to defend Little Round Top against seemingly impossible odds. Tom Berenger does a winning turn as Longstreet, while Richard Jordan gives a haunting performance as the Confederate officer, Low Armistead. In the end, against all odds, Gettysburg actually shines. The epic 1984 crime movie Once Upon a Time in America is the final entry in Italian director Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time trilogy. 
Set in 1918, it follows two petty criminals who lead a group of youngsters from the slums of Manhattan's Jewish ghetto to prominence in the world of organized crime. Naturally, this movie has all the mainstays of classic gangster cinema, extreme violence, thick New York accents, drug use, unscrupulous characters, and Joe Pesci. Unfortunately, studio meddling undermined Once Upon a Time's chances at the United States box office. The Lad Company, which produced and distributed the movie, was spooked by the initial six-hour two-part release that Leone had premiered in Europe and trimmed it down to 139 minutes without his consent or involvement. Inevitably, critics and audiences alike disliked this shortened release, and the movie pretty much bombed at the box office. Nowadays, at least, the full version of Once Upon a Time in America enjoys a much more favorable reputation with critics and audiences, leading to this film becoming yet another cautionary tale of the perils of unwelcome studio interference. Kenneth Branagh's adaptions of the works of William Shakespeare are some of the most popular and critically acclaimed to date, and one of the best of all is 1996's Hamlet, a word-for-word -word recreation of the original play. This movie's cast is by far its finest asset. Alas. Poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. Branagh's turn as Prince Hamlet is obviously the heart of the movie, but Derek Jacoby's performance as King Claudius, killer of Hamlet's father, and the story's primary antagonist is just as memorable. In fact, pretty much every actor in Hamlet has a good go at stealing the show. Although perhaps the most surprising is a young pre-Titanic Kate Winslet who plays Ophelia. Rana has made a handful of tweaks and alterations to the original play, of course, most notably the 19th century setting and the inclusion of a number of flashbacks. But Hamlet still manages to pull these off without losing any of the magic of Shakespeare's original play. Overall, this movie more than justifies its four-hour runtime. The long-running artistic collaboration between Hungarian director Bélatar and novelist László Krasna Horke came to a head in 1994 with Shatan Tango. This seven-hour, 12-chapter behemoth of a film follows the exploits of the slick-tongued Irameus who arrives at a small farming commune in the final days of communism, and after promising them good fortunes in a wondrous new land, ends up making off with all their money. It would be nigh on impossible to even go into the many, many characters and plot developments that feature throughout Shatan Tango. All you need to know is that it's widely considered one of the best films ever made, boasts a rare 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and is widely regarded as a masterpiece of Eastern European cinema. The 2003 Italian historical drama The Best of Youth follows Nicola and Matteo Carati, two brothers from Rome who are forced to navigate the difficulties of life in post-World War II Italy. After a flood in Florence, Nicola marries Giulia, a pianist and political extremist, before entering into the field of psychiatry. Meanwhile, Matteo joins up with the police and tries to right society's wrongs with brute force before meeting and falling in love with Mirella, a starry-eyed photographer. Over the course of the film's six-and-a-half-hour runtime, these four characters survive floods, violence, and extreme political turbulence as they discover all kinds of truths about themselves and each other. Like many other super-long films, director Marco Tolio Giordana originally wanted The Best of Youth to be a TV miniseries. Instead, it was given a theatrical premiere at the 2003 Cannes Film Festival, where critics overlooked its punishing runtime to give it widespread acclaim, as well as the coveted Prix en sautant regard. If there's such a thing as a Holocaust movie for the faint of heart, it's probably not worth watching. Still, few of them are quite so gut-wrenching, haunting, terrifying, enraging, and unforgettable as Shoah. French director Claude Lanzmann's nine-hour documentary. In his movie, Lanzmann examines every last detail of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, beginning in the Warsaw Ghetto, a tiny district where that city's Jewish population was corralled by Nazi occupiers before being shipped off to concentration camps. Shoah's story also delves into the horrors of the labor and extermination camps themselves, the millions of Jews, communists, Roma, and other so-called undesirables who were imprisoned and killed in them, the administrators and soldiers who ran them, and the civilians who lived nearby. Perhaps most shockingly of all, however, is Shoah's exploration of the banality of the evil that characterized the Nazis' crimes. Although the movie doesn't really touch on Holocaust denial, many of the people interviewed for the documentary still refuse to take responsibility for their roles in the Holocaust. It's moments like these that help make Lanzmann's movie not just an incredibly uncomfortable watch, to say the least, but a truly essential one, too. As if its 11 Oscar wins weren't proof enough, 2003's Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King is one of the most critically acclaimed and popular movies of all time. It's one of those films where each rewatch makes you fall in love a little harder, in which every last scene is shot, performed, and scored to perfection. You 
out to no one. As for the film's finest moments, where do you even start? There's the tragedy of the fall of Azgiliath, in which Faramir leads his remaining men on a chaotic retreat back to Minas Tirith. There's Pippin's song performed for a feasting Denethor as Faramir rides back to Azgiliath on a suicide mission. There's the lightning of the beacons, Gandalf's recollection of the afterlife, Eowyn's battle against the Witch King, Frodo and Sam's climb up Mount Doom, the battle at the Black Gate, and perhaps most famously of all, the ride of the Rohirrim, which might be the most fist-pumping, beautiful, edge-of-your-seat battle sequence ever put to film. The theatrical version of The Return of the King only actually runs for about three and a half hours, but the extended edition adds on a whole heap more, including the death of Saruman, Gandalf's confrontation with the Witch King, and the hero's confrontation with the mouth of Sauron. Now, some say this version of the film is overstuffed. Heck, some people think the theatrical release is. But the truth is that the extended version of The Return of the King represents the very best of Peter Jackson's momentous, beautiful, and epic Lord of the Rings trilogy. Check out one of our newest videos right here, plus even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.